Welcome to the Thyroid Fixer Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Amy, and we're diving deep into the world of hormones, especially for all you fierce women in perimenopause and menopause and everyone struggling with hypothyroidism. So if you are battling weight gain, you're feeling like shedding those pounds is an impossible feat. If you're dealing with plummeting energy levels, gut-wrenching fatigue, or a libido that seems to have left town, then you're in the right place. And let's not even start on the hair loss. If these symptoms are sounding all too familiar, you have found your tribe. My goal is to educate, empower, and shake up your world. Remember, I want you to embrace every inch of that badass woman that you truly are. So if you're ready to dive in and fix things, let's go. I am so thrilled to introduce you to Hormone Solutions by my dear friend, Karen Martell, hormone expert, by the way, in all things peri and postmenopausal for you ladies, but she's also a passionate advocate for clean, safe products. So that's why she created Hormone Solutions, a line of over-the-counter bioidentical hormone creams, free of the fragrances and the parabens that we want to avoid, of course. So let's walk you through a couple of them. First of all, Progestcom. We know progesterone is amazing at calming your nervous system, helping you sleep, It inhibits breast tissue overgrowth, so promotes breast health. And then we have Estro 2 Rejuvenate. This is an amazing face and body cream. I love what it does for your skin. It is so silky smooth, and it plumps wrinkles and helps with collagen formation. Then we have Estro Vitality. This is the estradiol cream. So relief from pre- and postmenopausal symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, the mood swings, all the things. She has really put her heart and soul into this line. I love her for bringing this to the masses so you can all experience the power of bioidentical hormones safely, effectively, without the need to go to your doctor and beg for a hormone prescription, right? So what you're going to do, you're going to click that link in the show notes and you're going to use the code Dr. Amy. That is going to save you some money when you try out Hormone Solutions. Do you ever come home from a really long day, your energy's drained, and you just want to sit down and watch Netflix and eat a good dinner, but you got to still squeeze in your workout. So how about if you actually got home at seven and your workout was done by 7.05? Does that blow your mind? You're already done. You're unwinding. That's the reality with Carol Bike. In just five minutes, You experience a workout that is scientifically proven to be as effective as a 45-minute run. Carol isn't just a time saver. It's your literal shortcut to health, happiness, better muscles, lower body fat, leaving you more time for what actually matters in life, like watching Netflix and eating a great dinner. So if you want to check out Carol Bike, they give you... A, a warranty, a trial period that is unmatched. They'll even come get it if you don't like it. 30 days. I mean, who can even beat that? So check it out. Go to carolbike.com, C-A-R-O-L-B-I-K-E.com. You're going to use the code Dr. Amy if you grab one of these bad boys, which I highly recommend doing. You're going to use the code Dr. Amy. That is going to save you $100 off. And again, there's no risk. There's no risk. Try it for 30 days. If you don't like it, they will come pick it up. But I guarantee you the time-saving aspect, the muscle-building aspect, the fat-burning aspect, you're just going to love it. Josh, I'm so excited to have you on today because as we were talking off air, like I shared, I really have not dove into the gut much. We had maybe one other specialist on all of our 400 episodes. And this is an ask from my community. They want to know more and more and more about the gut because, you know, we hear so much these days about, well, there's the gut brain connection and the gut immune connection, but no one's really dove into the why and why are we seeing so many gut issues in America, in the US, really in the world, but we're going to focus here and and what we can do about it. So a big thank you for coming on today because my audience is going to just eat this up. I know it. It's a pleasure to be here. Honestly, any platform that I can talk about the gut 
And you know what? I just found it so poetic. It was actually this week. So I do Taekwondo as a recreational activity. I was just traveling in, ta- in, in Dallas, Texas for NOLA Cause. I went to Miami for Ben Azadi's podcast. We've been traveling, talking about the gut, gut disease and stool. And this week I got my brown belt. So it just seems very poetic. You know? <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Good for you. I love yeah, it. Yeah. Love so it. I'm going to draw a little poop emoji on it. There you go. Yeah. We all love poop emojis and we talk about poop here. It's an open discussion. So that's why you fit right in. Perfect. (laughs) So I want to know, as everyone else wants to know, how did you get into specializing in, in the gut? My favorite way to put it is my entire life, Amy, up to this point is a chain of happy accidents, kind of like falling forward. So my first career was a paramedic. I fell in love with it. I just really enjoyed the trauma. Uh, I don't mean like the psychological trauma of being a paramedic. Right. Uh, I do mean, you know, the, the trauma cases that you go to see in the emergencies and car accidents. And it was always an adrenaline rush. And there was other calls I enjoyed. You always had to think on your feet, but it wasn't medicine to me. You know, it was sick care. It was emergency care. And probably 20% of the calls we did were trauma. The other 80% was medical, heart disease and strokes and diabetes uh, incidents and all kinds of stuff. And so I found myself getting these people over to the hospital and the doctors would give them more of the same drug. They'd change their drug, send them home. You'd pick them up every couple of weeks until they were dead and stop calling. And I thought like, it's not medicine. And so yeah. by a chain of happy accidents, I ended up moving across the country, trying to find work. I was like, well, I'll get a job that pays better or work in a bigger city where there's more action going on. And between jobs, I picked up a job as a personal trainer. I'm in my early 20s now, and I've been in the fitness world since I was 15, learning training from the old bodybuilders and Arnold. And I had stacks of these books from the 80s. And I was I really enjoyed it. And one of my early clients who came to see me was named Lynn. And so Lynn and I started working together. She was 57 years old. Breakfast was 17 pills and insulin. She had nine more pills and insulin for bedtime. She had a CPAP machine. She had high blood pressure. What I'm looking back now identifies borderline congestive heart failure. She was on the disability list at work, but she had everything under the sun, kind of your typical American over 50, medicated out the wazoo and declining in health. And we started working together, just basics of nutrition and exercise and recovering her nervous system and really basic stuff. And by the time she was 59, so this is two years into our time together, I said, Lynn, how much do you trust me? So what? I trust you. Absolutely. No problem. Because by this time, Amy, she's off all medications except for two. She's no longer diabetic. Her eyesight improved. She had to get a a lower prescription on her glasses because her eyes were getting better. Uh, She wasn't on her CPAP anymore. No more high blood pressure. She was off disability. I said, all right, you trust me, sign here. And she did blindly. I said, great. See you in three months. You got your first powerlifting competition. And so I put her into the raw powerlifting federation here in Canada. And it was really, yeah, I got her a belt and a singlet. It was awesome. And wouldn't you know it, she broke her first world record in her first competition for the 59 plus division. And she kept breaking them till she was like 62, 63 when she retired. And it just highlighted so much the power and potential of the human body to heal itself. Fast forward, I was at a trade show doing some work for some other places, and I saw a woman on stage talking about the gut microbiome, how we develop it right from birth to death, the importance, how it's connected. And my jaw was on the floor this entire time of this 30-minute presentation. I'm sure somebody thought I was uh, a little bit off my rock or a few fries short of a Happy Meal, but uh, it was incredible. And I, I fell in love at first sight. I said, that is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. And so I went back to school. I saved up for a little bit, went back, became a nutritionist and dove all in. And then my entire career pushed me into gut health. Everybody I saw came back to the gut until the worst of the worst gut diseases were seeing me. And here we are many, many years later, I specialize in Crohn's and colitis and we're reversing it far beyond what any medical professional ever thought possible. It's quite remarkable. Well, and I don't doubt that because that's, the majority of of the people that we encounter and interact with have on our podcast, you know, we're all kind of in that same grouping of we go deeper than the medical community. And whether it's a gastroenterologist or in my case, mm-hmm. an endocrinologist, those ologists, <laughs> those specialists, they don't think outside the box. They don't spend more than seven minutes with a patient. How in the world are you going to truly get someone through a disease state like Crohn's colitis with a seven minute visit? You you just can't. Mm -hmm. So I applaud you and everyone with gut issues applauds you and thanks you for being in this space and actually doing what needs to be done. It is a passion. It really is. And it is a need. When you say what needs to be done, it is a need. There are 
North America is the gut disease capital of the world, bar none, statistically speaking, unquestionably. Okay, wait, that's crazy because when you think of gut disease Mm -hmm. and the world, right, the first thing that would come to my mind would be, oh, it's going to be a third world country where they have Giardia and parasites and their Mm -hmm. bellies are bloated and distended from all the bugs in it. No, it's North America. Mm -hmm. North America. And I'll break it down for you. Here's why. When I say gut disease, I am talking, and I want to preface for all the listeners, this is sort of a, a preface to keep in mind moving forward. I talk about Crohn's colitis because that's what I specialize in as a practice. All gut disease in my mind, which I believe is the cornerstone of why we're so successful, is a spectrum. Today, you start with bloat. Years from now, you have IBS. Years from now, you have Crohn's colitis. The Western medical system has split them over the last 30, 40 years. Even the Venn diagrams are almost identical. It's just who's got more severe symptoms. And so I look at all these diseases as wearing a pair of shoes without socks and your heel rubs red and raw until it gets blistered and it bleeds. That is your bloat to bloody stool spectrum from IBS to IBD. Mm -hmm. And so that's my preface for this entire episode. So no matter where you are, this is what we're doing here. And so when I say they're the gut disease capital of the world, there's two reasons I want to pull up. Number one, Depending on the size and the scale of the study, anywhere from 60 to 72% of Americans complain of having one gut issue at least once a week. So gas, bloat, constipation, diarrhea, pain, cramping, aches, acid reflux, whatever it might be, they're having these issues once a week, which is relatively unheard of. This should not be happening. You shouldn't have so much dysfunction that you have these, these backups, right? It's like an assembly line falling apart. If every week Ford Motor Company had something going on, They'd be, they'd be losing hundreds of thousands of dollars per minute, these guys. And so look at this in the human body. And so if we go further now onto the spectrum from gas and bloat with 60 to 72% of Americans complaining, North America as a unit, so it's even say Canada, the US, it's less than 5% of the global population. If we go back as per CDC in 1990, there was roughly, depends on the stats you look at, one and a half to three million global cases being treated by a doctor of Crohn's and colitis. Today, last last point of stats is actually 2020, was 7 million plus. Today, it's estimated 8 to 8.5 million. So we had this exponential growth. Well, out of that, say 8 million, 50% is in North America, which is just 5% of the globe. And so when 5% of the globe has 50% of the issues, and the, those others not diagnosed are dealing with 60 to 70% of them complaining of a low-grade issue, which is bound to wear and tear like the heel in a shoe, we are the gut disease capital of the world. And it's no coincidence if we look at why that's happening. Okay. Well, why is that happening? What is going on? What are we doing to ourselves? What's happening? I was hoping you'd ask and not leave a cliffhanger. (laughs) (laughs) So we have to look at the stats of what's actually going on. So number one, we have to look at the things that are causing these problems. So mold toxicity is a big one in gut disease. Probably 80, 90% of what I see in Crohn's colitis, again, the severe side, I see people on the low end with the same, which has not gotten worse yet, is going to be mycotoxins or mold and some sort of fungal overgrowth. We see that 80, 90% of the time, but we know 40 plus percent of homes in the United States have a mold problem. Antibiotics are a big one, right? Ripping apart our microbiomes. Well, antibiotic usage has climbed. I forget exactly what it is. I think it's up 43 to 50% since the year 2000. Mm -hmm. We have to look at Lyme disease, heavy metals, parasites, motility disorders, which are caused by all kinds of medication and chronic stress. We're under the fire all the time. And then if we go one step further and look at pesticides, the actual usage has gone up between two to four times the amount, we pour over a billion pounds of bacteria and microbe cause or killing pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, or denticides, any sides, pouring them on our food, a billion pounds plus a year. And since 1990, the variety of pesticides we've used has gone up 19 times. And we have roughly 50% more toxic, known toxic pesticides to like mutate DNA and destroy bacteria and lead to cancers and disease than the UK. And so like, it's like we're deliberately poisoning ourselves and the FDA is just sliding some cash under the table to the FDA saying, just to prove it, it's fine. And we're pushing all this stuff through. And this is, this is a start. Like we haven't even gotten into childbirth and C-sections and breastfeeding and chemicals and placenta tissue. It's crazy. It almost is overwhelming when you think about it, because even, you know, you might have, we might have listeners right now going, well, I eat all organic. So to which I'll argue, and I'll I'll get your take on this too. If you've ever driven through the Midwest and, you know, fields of, of gold, and you see these big bat wing sprayers, 
going down a field, just spraying all the wheat or all the soy or the corn or whatever they're spraying with pesticides. And let's say the organic farmer is next door. Do you think that that spray isn't going over into the organic farmer's Mm. crop? I mean, it is. I think there's cross-contamination too, because we know even with the organic label, there is still allowed a certain amount, parts per billion of pesticides allowed to still get that organic stamp. So I think it's it's almost like we're we're just being bombarded at every turn. And and then it yeah. comes down to, you know, what can we do about it? No, I absolutely agree. It is a bombardment. I don't want to leave this episode by the end of this one on doom and gloom. We'll definitely go through some stuff we can do. Right. Um, because that's that's a habit we get into as providers or healthcare practitioners, like big warning label, everybody listen. And they're going, oh shit, I'm listening. Okay, thanks for coming to my TED talk. And that's it. Like, what yeah. now? Now what? You know? Right. <laughs> and so when we look at that, cross contamination is a huge thing. And I'm going to pull some numbers out of my ass because I'm trying to recall. I had a, just published episode 49 actually last week with uh, Dr. Tom O'Brien. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about some stats of toxicity and it is bombarding. It's coming from everywhere. So we were talking about. He's working on a new documentary, The Inflammation Equation, with Dr. Jeffrey Bland. It's going to be really amazing. And so some of the stuff they're going through, they had found that women who use excess phthalates, for example, so your nail polish, just looking at nails and chemicals and perfumes, they found from taking these women and testing their lifestyle and usage, following them for seven years after baby was born till they're seven years old doing IQ tests, they found women who had more phthalates in their body, their babies on average had seven points lower in their IQ. Now, one to two points is pretty noticeable. Seven points is from average to special. That's someone who's working their ass off and getting straight C's. Yeah. And so it's it's quite detrimental. But not only that, these toxins, we go right from development, neurodevelopment. We know that the gut and the brain are the same tissue in utero as they're being developed and they kind of split and, and do their own thing. But if we look at this development, I, these are the numbers I'm pulling out of my ass. I think it was something like the difference between women eating say three meals a day, seven days a week, non-organic to women eating seven times or seven days a week, only three of those 21 meals were organic, just three. And they had something like a 17% higher probability of having a healthier full-term pregnancy than those women who are not. And so it's quite dramatic when we look at the body's ability to detoxify itself, there is, there comes a tipping point, but only three out of 21 meals being organic made up to a 17 or so percent difference in fetal development, successful, healthy pregnancy. And so to say organic versus non-organic, it is so much, even with the cross contamination, the poison makes, or the dose makes the poison, but the poison's the poison. And our bodies are remarkable because they're so incredible at actually detoxing this stuff and, and basically causing the minimal amount of damage possible. But I promise you it's screwing your shit up no matter what dose. Yeah. So that, that does give hope though, you know, that, so okay, even if we make some changes and maybe you do a little bit more than, than three meals out of 21, if you make some changes, you are going to have an impact on your health. So that at least gives a little bit of hope. Oh yeah. Even those think. little changes. If you you buy one or two of your vegetables a week, organic, my preference, go to the EWG, Environmental Working Group, find yeah. their clean 15 list. If you eat those, buy those organic, and you can make probably 17 to 30% difference by just changing a small handful of things. And so that is the answer to the doom and gloom is little changes can have big results. Make a big difference. So what about the tie-in? You mentioned in fetal development that the gut and the brain are the same tissue. I actually did not know that. Mm -hmm. I do know that there's a gut brain connection when we're dealing with anxiety and depression. I know that there's a connection with just general inflammation and specifically and and a, a huge care of my audience, my listeners would be the weight issue. And can mm-hmm. our guts actually be contributing to weight gain or inability to lose weight? So I know I just dumped a whole lot on you at once, but Let can me we write pick these apart? Down. Yeah, so we <laughs> mental health, <laughs> yeah. general inflammation, because when we're talking about inflammation, it's going to affect hormones, it's going to affect insulin signaling. Obviously, it's going to affect your thyroid, Hashimoto's, autoimmune, and then weight, which is kind of tied to everything. 
I love that you asked those questions. Those are some of my favorite things to talk about. So same brainwave. So in utero, right? So during fetal development, the gut and brain do come from the same embryonic tissues. So it's called a neural tube. And that neural tube is a structure that forms very early. And it actually gives rise to the central nervous system, right? So your brain and spinal cord and the GI tracts, that's going to be your entire gut. And so as that embryo starts to develop, these tubes undergo a process of, we'll call it like, specialization and differentiation where the tissues start to become their own things as they start to grow based on genetic coding. And this is where you get your distinctive structures being formed. Yeah. And so you get one end, you got your brain and spine, the other, you have your gut. Uh, and that's that neurulation uh, that it's called. And so they are made from the same and they are very interconnected on a very interesting level. And so we go back, like we talk about the gut brain connection, for example, all the time, everybody's gut brain, gut brain. What does gut brain actually mean? Right. We know that our gut creates, you know, up to 90% of our neurotransmitters. So your dopamine and serotonins come from your gut. So here's your gut brain connection, number one. Number mm -hmm. two, your gut instinct. So if think about having a sprained ankle, for example, right? You can't do your daily functions very well. You can't perform. You're kind of limping along. You're a bit slower. We all know what a gut instinct is. It's when you get that feeling in your gut, which is best described as like a physical manifestation of something your subconscious knows. Your subconscious fires so much faster than any other cognitive process you could possibly have, right? Your, your gut, if you think about it, driving on a highway, right? The difference between your conscious mind processing information, it's the equivalent about going about 100 miles an hour. Your subconscious fires at about 100,000 miles per hour. So we're literally talking about like a three-legged turtle versus a Millennium Falcon jumping to hyperspace. Like it is a dramatic difference but they communicate together through chemical signals and messengers there's i don't know how many billions of neurons in your brain but you got upwards of 500 million inside of your gut so there are actual neurons and nerve tissue that send signals and do stuff so that's that's sort of your gut brain connection now if you're inflamed in the gut i have this crazy hypothesis that if your gut is not healthy then even your subconscious defense mechanisms, that fight or flight, might actually be impaired like a sprained ankle because it can't function or activate as quickly as it should to keep you safe. That's just a fun sidebar I've been sort of picking apart. But that ties to your mental health. So inflammation in the gut, not only is that going to deal with neurotransmitters, but you'd be hard pressed to find anyone, and I mean anyone, who has a mental health condition of depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, anything who does not have some sort of gut dysfunction. For a couple of reasons. One, you got your neurological tissue being impaired. Number two, you got your neurochemicals, those neurotransmitters being impaired. But if we look at these on a very basic level, number three, inflammation in the gut comes with dysbiosis. And dysbiosis or imbalance in your gut bacteria, a disharmony in the balance of gut bacteria often leads to these endotoxins being produced, which get into your blood lymphatic system, getting through the blood brain barrier and creating inflammation in the brain. And a lot of there are many circles who have attributed not only neurotransmitter or neurochemical imbalances to brain issues and mental health disorders, but also inflammation in the brain. And so the gut-brain connection is very real for many, many reasons. Now, that's that's two out of your four. I'll keep going. Well, yeah. Wait, pause on that because it's interesting. As you were speaking, this came to mind. I had a, a very close friend that was diagnosed bipolar. And at the time he mm. was diagnosed, he was overweight, working in the oil and gas industry. So if you know oil and gas guys, I mean, they're eating at Cheats and McDonald's and working 12 hour shifts and night shifts and all that. I mean, it's just a disastrous job for your health. And he wasn't working out and all that. And he was on medication for the bipolar and you know, it didn't work and would go on and off. It wasn't until he really buckled down and says, okay, enough is enough. I'm going to make my own food. I'm going to take it on the job. I'm going to, if I have to get up, you know, at 3 a.m. to get to the gym, to get to the, to work at 6 a.m., I'm going to do that. And he started doing that and he lost the weight and he was eating very clean. So clear down all those processed foods, the convenience store foods, all of that. And, you know, I mean, basically, I don't want to say his bipolar went away, but he doesn't need medication. He's stable. He doesn't have the highs and the lows. And I mean, that's an extreme mental condition, right? We might have depression, anxiety, but then over here we have the schizophrenia and bipolar that's on the extreme end. And to see that improve with just improving what you're putting into your body and into your gut I mean, that's huge. So that kind of goes back to what you're saying. It's like, yes, yes, there is 
a gut brain connection. There is a toxin brain connection, mm-hmm. which you're putting into your gut connection. And I mean, imagine if it helps bipolar and schizophrenia, it's going to help someone who's a little bit more anxious, mm-hmm. a little more depressed. It's like, always clean up your freaking food, clean up your gut, do some protocols because it can make a huge difference and you can get off the antidepressants. You want to know my number one hack for improving my focus, my brain, my energy, and my metabolism? It's jumping in my cold chur, cold plunge three, four times a week because studies show that 11 minutes of cold exposure per week improves your mood, speeds up recovery time from hard workouts, enhances your metabolism, reduces stress, and definitely you will see improvements if you're tracking your sleep or even if you're just noticing that you're sleeping better, you will see improvements in your sleep quality. Personally, I have seen just a huge, huge impact in all of those markers in my life since regularly using my culture cold plunge. So what you want to do if you want all these benefits too, you're going to go to culture.com, C-O-L-D-T-U-R-E.com backslash Dr. Amy, D-R-A-M-I-E. That's going to save you 200 bucks. And that's a huge savings. This tub is so easy to use, easy to put together. You are going to love having it right there for you. You jump in, you do your breathing. I promise you there are benefits galore. Oh, did we even mention the brown fat? (gasps) Browning your adipose tissue. What does that do? Speeds up your metabolism as well. So go to culture.com backslash Dr. Amy and grab yours. Let me know how it goes. Let me know about all those improvements that you see. Yeah, I'm I'm not going to say it anti-advocate of, I don't know what the, what's the opposite of the word advocate? I'm looking for a fancy word. I know what you're saying. No, I, I, I'm the same way. I'm not anti antidepressant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but it, because it, it is needed in certain cases, hands down, hands down. But I'm saying, medicine. you know, when you look at that particular case of someone with bipolar now being stable, you know, I mean, that's pretty impactful. It's amazing. And that's integrative medicine comes into play, right? I often, people kind of jump to conclusions. It's the internet. Um, But what happens, I say, hey, we can actually reverse Crohn's and colitis holistically. And they go, well, you're anti-medication. I'm like, no, no, no. I am pro-medication in some instances. There are some instances where your medication, your biologics, your immunosuppressive drugs are going to inhibit your ability to make next steps. But for the most part, I'm not going in for surgery without anesthesia. Like, let me look under the hood while we're able to, while your quality of life is there. So someone dealing with mental health conditions, same situation, let them have the drugs until we can get to the root cause. And then we'll talk about maybe considering a taper with your doctor. Yep. Um, Right. And that's very important to do, which I'm sure you do in thyroid. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. When it, it, when it is indeed a band-aid med, then we can talk about tapering or going off completely. Once you fix the situation, once you totally address what that underlying cause is. So yeah, I just wanted to pause on that story, but keep going with the inflammation, weight, all that good stuff. I love it. Yeah. I wrote them down. I'm glad you remembered. I didn't. (laughs) So let's talk about general inflammation for the same reason these toxins can get around the body and get to the brain, cause inflammation in the brain. We have to look at genes, for example. So genetics, people often chalk it up to, and I do blame the Western system for saying, oh, it's genetic. Your Crohn's colitis is genetic. Your Hashimoto's is genetic. Bullshit. It's not genetic. Genetics As we know, the saying goes, genetics load the gun, lifestyle pulls the trigger. And so if you have the chain and you start pulling on it, if that gene is the weak link, that's where you'll have the problem. My family, my entire family has digestive issues, but that's because our weak link is the gene. So if we don't take care of ourselves properly, the first thing to go is our gut. I have other clients who get it in their joints because arthritis is in their genes. They don't have genetic arthritis. They're genetically predisposed to expressing inflammation through the pathway of their joints. That's all it is. And so if we break it down to a very basic level of toxins leaking out of the gut, it's only one cell from your small intestine, two cells from your large to get into your lymphatic system in your blood, which is the super highway around every tissue in your body. Mm -hmm. Blood goes everywhere. And if you have toxins floating in there, your immune system says, hey man, you shouldn't be in here. We got to get rid of you. So it sends an immune signal down and says, let's get rid of you. Sends your blood cells and white blood cells down to clean out the areas. Well, inflammation by nature is a good thing. That is exactly that. It's your body trying to heal you. And so when you have inflammation in your joints, we have to ask, why am I inflamed? 
What is my body trying to heal me from that is currently inside my joints? Why are my cytokines in here? Why are my other white blood cells here trying to heal this, causing inflammation? That's what we never ask you. Oh, I'm inflamed, take an ibuprofen. Or I'm inflamed, take some immunosuppressive drugs. When it comes to your Crohn's colitis even, unquestionably across the globe, doctors are going, yeah, it's autoimmune, it's genetic, or it's environmental unknown. We don't really know. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you exactly what it is, right? We just have to figure out what that thing is or the compounding of things that are causing the inflammation because your body is trying to heal your gut from something. And so that inflammation go anywhere. And so to hit your last question, yeah. talk about weight loss. So let's talk, let's talk about weight loss. So there was a really interesting study where researchers gave mice heavy doses of antibiotics and they wiped out their gut bacteria because they want to test the effects of things like calorie restriction or calorie deficits. And so they had control mice, right? The healthy untouched gut bacteria. And mm -hmm. they found that calorie restriction in the healthy mice, the control mice reduced body weight and provided benefits to their guts, like increases in good beneficial gut bacteria. But in the mice who were given antibiotics and they wiped out their gut bacteria, they did not get the same benefits from calorie restriction and their weight loss was limited or halted completely. And so this led the researchers effectively to the conclusion that our gut bacteria has a direct role in weight loss. And so we have to ask, like, if your gut bacteria is damaged, can you still lose weight? And so... Interestingly enough, we can restore gut bacteria. To what degree, we don't know. But they did another study where they took these mice and they fed the obese mice, the mice who were actually gaining weight and their, met their metabolism, their metabolic processes were slowed due to destroyed gut bacteria. And they gave these mice, because mice eat poop, they eat feces. And so they gave them a diet mixed in with feces from lean, healthy mice with good bacteria. And they found the obese mice were actually able now to lose weight. And on the flip side, when the lean mice were given the, the feces from the obese mice, their weight started to halt or they started to gain weight, showing that our gut bacteria has this major bidirectional role, which is where we now get these treatments. I'm not going to say that's the root, but we do see fecal transplant now being a thing. I was going to ask you about that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'm not saying go and eat your neighbor's poop or eat mouse poop. Right. It's just so we're clear to that one. What I am saying is that our gut bacteria can be altered for better or for worse. And so it's really interesting is the lifestyle around that even. We've talked about the antibiotics. We've talked about the lifestyle. We talked about the stress or touched on. There's all kinds of things just wreaking havoc on our gut bacteria. It's it's really quite limits, limitless what's destroying it. Uh, looking at fast food, uh, tobacco consumption. We look at alcohol. The average male consumes something like, I don't want to say it's 16 liters a year or something on top of the average adult consuming 100 plus pounds of sugar per year. It's crazy. Yeah. And so- these feed and destroy our bacterial balances. And so that's where all this stuff starts to come from. But we can actually repair and rebuild our gut bacteria through a lot of ways. So I'll throw another study at you where they had, I think it was in cell reports or the scientists in 2018, but they had actually taken microbiome maps, so GI stool samples, and they, mm -hmm. they took the bacteria and measured it. For the listeners here, a GI map is where you take the bacteria and you quantify it out to see what you have and what ratios to the best of our ability that we have with technology in 2024. Yep. And so what they did is they took stool samples from infants and adults in three locations. One was major North American cities. Two was in urban or urbanized Nigerian cities. And the third was rural Nigerian. And okay. so what they had was Americans that had babies and they had adults. Now in the Americans, they found a really big wide discrepancy in the gut bacteria, which was that babies had a lot of these bacteria adults didn't have because they were effectively what the conclusion would be is that they were destroyed over time from whatever they were destroyed by, be it bacteria, lifestyle, et cetera. Yep. They found that the middle ground was the urbanized Nigerians, adults and children, but the rural children and adult Nigerians actually had the best, most diverse biomes where they had, because they were living off the land. They were growing their own food. They were playing outside. They were engaging with animals and playing in the dirt and houses. They actually have houses still made out of mud and grass because guess what? It actually cools itself. We're not breathing recycled air, which is one of the main top five pollutants for humans is recycled indoor air. Yeah. And so they have all these benefits that they have. And so the difference in bacteria from Nigerian or rural Nigerian babies and adults was much narrower, almost on par. They went, oh, their bacteria looks very comparable because it wasn't destroyed. Interestingly enough, as a sidebar for those talking about diet, you have plant-based, right? Or vegan and all the way to carnivore. We have these mm -hmm. spectrums now. 
Okay. Well, they also showed that these rural living Nigerians had more bacteria capable of breaking down and digesting fibers and plant materials, more so than Americans did, indicating that Americans might actually be better off on carnivore because we've lost our ability to digest it. And so on the food side, I don't believe we're inherently unable to eat vegetables. I think we've been altered to a way where it's very difficult for most of us to do so. And so it's what we're doing to our guts and what we're putting on our food, I believe, are the problem, not the foods themselves. Or just even the soil that the vegetables are growing in. It's so depleted totally. that the vegetables aren't even the same. Oh. I mean, you can you can taste the difference if you go to a farmer's market versus buying a tomato at the grocery store. I mean, there's a huge difference. So I think just the, the chemicals, the structure of the plant itself, the vegetable itself has changed. And real quick, I want to I want to go back to what you talked about about fecal transplants because I heard a lecture from Liz Lipsky. She's a, a gut specialist. She's a with the Institute for Functional Medicine and and MUIH. And she was talking about these two cases of fecal transplant, kind of fecal transplant gone wrong. Now I don't know if it was a DIY or what, but how and this speaks to how powerful the gut is and and the effect on the body. So one person, you know, normally with fecal transplants, they thoroughly test the the donor's microbiome and they do just a full workup. So mm -hmm. you want to make sure is this person that you're getting the poop from, are they depressed? Are they anxious? Do they have metabolic disease? You know, you don't want to transfer that over. Well, this particular mm -hmm. person had a propensity for anxiety. And I don't know all the details, but the bottom line is they did the fecal transplant into a person that did not have a propensity for anxiety. And the person got the fecal transplant and became anxious. So that is the impact of, and again, we're not talking about transferring brain matter. We're talking about transferring poop. And, and that person that received the fecal transplant became anxious. The other, uh, on the weight aspect, same thing, fecal transplant. This particular individual had a propensity to or obesity and metabolic mm. disease. I, and again, I don't know, did she have insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, a thyroid problem, don't know. But they transferred it to a relatively thin person. And this was for C. diff because that's normally where we see fecal transplants being used now is in the cases of C. diff. Um, they, they received the fecal transplant and they started gaining weight when they never had a weight problem before. So you, you really kind of look at, I, I know those are two negative cases, but, but it speaks to the power of what comes into your body, good or bad. And, and how the, I don't know, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Basically the microbiome is so specified and personalized that you can literally transfer health or non-health to another person. And you're just transferring gut stuff. <laughs> I didn't say you're, that you're scientifically so at all. <laughs> I'm always looking for big words to make me sound smart. I am on the same Gut page. stuff. <laughs> Gut stuff. Yeah. So here's what's interesting. I'll throw another one at you. There's a documentary by Saffron Cassidy called Designer Shit. And it's actually about a woman trying to find a, a cure effectively for all sort of colitis and trying to find fecal transplant. She ended up doing her own DIY. Yep. Um, she had her husband's thoroughly tested and went through and they used his. And it was actually, there's three different ways to do them uh, so far. I doubt there's going to be more in the future. One is an oral capsule. Yep. And my first question was, what if they break down half and burp? It's a very dense capsule. And so it will get all the way through before it breaks down and oh, seeds. Oh, man. Yeah, gross. Yeah, I just had that thought. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and the second one is through colonoscopy. The third is just through a retention enema. And so she literally just took stool from a tray that was, you know, we'll say farmed from him, stuck it in the freezer when it was time, dropped it in a blender with water, stuck it into an enema kit and face down ass up and gave herself a retention enema. And mm -hmm. she did this daily for, I think it was like three years. And she had some success right away. She started feeling better within two weeks and she got worse again. It was all over the place. Inside this documentary, there was a gentleman, this is a crazy story, who decided to do his own DIY for his ulcerative colitis. Now, I want to be very clear. I am not saying do a DIY because the following story I'm going to give you after this one is lethal. Someone died. But this gentleman did his own DIY using his mom's stool and he got better. His ulcerative colitis was gone, but he also developed menopause symptoms, hot flashes and all that stuff. Oh Isn't my that God. Wild? That's and crazy. There are stories of people who have done them who have died. And so it is 
thing to do by yourself. You don't know what you're getting, what you're putting in. Uh, Dr. William Lee, he's uh, yeah. famous. Yeah. So he was telling me he had done one. He had recently scrubbed in last year on a colonoscopy based fecal transplant and somebody's cancer went away, gone. Stage four cancer, stage three cancer disappeared because these are all inflammatory conditions, right? 14 out of the 15 leading causes of death, that's 93% as per the CDC. And we're talking all the common conditions, heart disease, cancers, strokes, respiratory issues, diabetes, Alzheimer's, kidney disease, liver disease, Parkinson's, hypertension. These are all conditions of chronic inflammatory conditions in the body linked directly to your gut. So 93% of the leading causes, the 15th leading cause not talked about is the umbrella of suicide, homicide, accident, injury. And that means Every normal cause of death we're calling normal is in fact not normal and they can be prevented by managing your gut, Crohn's and colitis included. Wow. Wow. Okay. I don't even know where to go from there. I just <laughs> thought for the the title of the podcast, like, can eating poop be your cure? But anyways, we'll probably move <laughs> I on. I did title that. one like that on mine. It's like, is eating mouse poop the cure to weight loss? <laughs> can eating poop cure your weight? Yeah. I Yeah. We'll figure that out. But so I'm actually in my mind, I'm tying together the the weight talk and and the GLPs. And I want to ask you about that because you had mentioned earlier mm. things that we see now with certain medications that are slowing gastric motility. And then, you know, ding, 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 all these terzepatide, semaglutide, the ozempic, the trulicity, all of that coming out, the significantly slow. GI motility. And this is where we're seeing some gastroparesis pop up, obviously the ton of nausea, heartburn. I think that those meds have a place. I'm pro GLPs when they're absolutely needed, but I'm interested to hear your take on them with in relationship to the gut. Yeah. So there's been some really nasty stories and obviously we know pharmaceutical companies pay billions of dollars a year. They have, I don't know, seven or 10 times, whatever it is, the marketing budget that they do actual R and D they sit on boards for news. So they get to decide who does and doesn't say what or criticize them or promote them. Like it's a whole thing. So the information we have is going to be limited, but there are many cases coming out positively that we've seen, or I shouldn't say positively, negatively rather, where people are having severe motility disorders or gastroparesis, like a paralysis of their stomach and GI, where they've needed surgery and emergency intervention. Yeah. And there are always horror stories. And these aren't super new medications, but the sample size we're now utilizing them because once you realize the, the, the golden goose of pharmaceuticals is weight loss, the golden goose, the biggest industry in the health and wellness space is weight loss. Like medicine is 4.5, almost $5 trillion a year. Weight loss alone, I forget, it's almost 800 billion, 900. So pushing a trillion dollars in yeah. weight loss alone. So these are golden goose drugs. Well, they're originally designed for modulating blood sugar in people with type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance. Right. But the happy side effect was, oh, it also suppresses appetite and blah, blah, blah. And it looks like it reduces weight. There's your golden goose. And so there's more and more people taking them who are metabolically unhealthy who are already very sick. Stats were from Dr. Joel Furman. It's something like 92 or 94% of all Americans are not metabolically healthy. If they're lean, they're kind of like skinny fat or they're not healthy. Yeah. They just don't exercise or don't eat or they're sick or have mental illness or something. And so you have people who are already unhealthy taking drugs that modify cells. Well, again, we're pulling on a chain and you're just adding more and more tension. And so if you're one of the unlucky ones, there can be GI issues. And so we have to look at these as, like you said, time and place, everything has a place. I don't believe that everyone should be jumping on these for weight loss. We are seeing a, an obesity epidemic for sure in this country. I forget the exact stats. It's like something like 70% of all Americans are considered overweight. 40% are considered obese. Something like 40% are pre-diabetic and 11 or 12% are actual diagnosed diabetic. Like it's crazy. And so these are food and lifestyle issues, gut bacteria issues. They are all kinds of other issues that can't be solved with a drug, but it's a convenient thing to utilize. And so if you already have gut bacterial issues, you're in the 70% who experience any kind of bloating. And some of us don't even know we're having it because it's so common now. Doctor right. goes, oh, it's normal. Or we accept a bowel boom and every three days, doctor's like, yeah, it's normal. It's not normal. It's common. Common is bad because everyone's sick. And so my opinion on these is very circumstantial. But I don't think they're the golden goose everyone thinks they are. I think they're being marketed to a convenience to make billions of dollars on people who just don't have the information to get themselves better naturally. Absolutely. I agree. And I, I just wanted you, you to chime in because there's so much talk around this now. So I think we have to give the pros and the cons to everyone so they they can make an informed decision. 
Like we said, yes. I mean, you know, sometimes it's it's warranted. If you have type 2 diabetes and you can't lose weight no matter what, and you've done all the things, then absolutely add that in. But I would say add it in for a short amount of time at the lowest dose that you can possibly handle at to for efficacy because you don't want to enter into that gastroparesis or GI paralysis. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for talking on that because I wanted to bring that up. So what can we do? What can we do to protect our gut bacteria outside of avoiding the alcohol and the the pesticides and all the things that we talked about? Mm -hmm. Well, it's maybe this is a great chance to kind of dive into birth to life development because yeah. There are a lot of people listening who are parents. No one listening right now is going to be a baby or a fetus, so that's fine. Um, but we'll touch on some of that for the mothers out there who are A, pregnant, B, wanting to get pregnant, or C, breastfeeding currently. Yes. And it's, so we'll go from that whole that whole gamut. So the first thing to having a healthy biome does come in utero. Right? We talked about all those toxins that we do know or are aware of that are inside the human body, even in a baby. There was actually a study, it makes its rounds every few years from the Red Cross back in, that was 2004. And they cut 10 umbilical cords and found 287 different chemicals of pollutants and pesticides and cigarettes and garbage and oil staining and all kinds of stuff. There were 180 chemicals known to cause cancers in humans and animals. 217 were toxic to the brain and nervous system, which again is part of your gut. 208 were known to cause birth defects in animal testing. And so we have all of these and that's a developing fetus. Like it's remarkable the resilience of a human body in a developing baby to be able to put out 287 chemicals and filter them. The average human was found to have 550 some odd chemicals, uh, the average adult rather. And so we're seeing this right from the ground. So number one, anybody who wants to get pregnant, I recommend six to 12 months of heavy detoxing, getting outside, getting fresh air, like purposely opening up your detox pathways, saunas, red lights, eating organic where you can, like these types of things will reduce the amount of chemicals, phthalates from like anything your great, great, great grandmother would not have had access to, you'd want to drop because your body will push them out eventually, right? Getting lean is a great way to push toxins out of your body. And sometimes for better or for worse. Uh, I don't know if you know Melissa McAllister, uh, Melissa made on Instagram. Okay. But uh, yeah, we we made good friends recently, but she was actually born. She has, uh, she's missing bones in her feet. She had some birth defects. And okay. what happened, her dad was actually in Vietnam and he was exposed to Agent Orange. And so she has healthy siblings who are older than her. Her dad was overweight. But when he, before mom got pregnant with Melissa, dad lost a bunch of weight was Agent Orange was stored in his fat cells. And so it got out into the sperm and she was born with birth defects. Wow. And so it's important for both partners. We always blame mom, mom toxic, mom this, mom that. But dad has a role to play as well. And it's very important to understand that both the quality of the sperm and the egg and development all matter. Mm -hmm. And so detoxing, getting lean, getting that stuff out of your system or not getting lean while you're conceiving or pregnant, like those things matter. And so that's going to create a healthy development, a fetal development. Now, something to keep in mind is when you're born, a baby has microbes in the placenta. They have microbes coming through the birth canal, like coming through the vaginal canal, you're covered head to toe. Breastfeeding inoculates the gut in the first three days, especially with colostrum and transfer factors and all these great things. And then for the one or two years you're breastfeeding, it's more nutrients, more microbes. But it's really interesting is that there are many hiccups that can happen in between. So we know, for example, babies that bottle feed strictly as opposed to breastfeeding are twice as likely to die from SIDS, to develop uh, diabetes and obesity and mental health conditions and autism and all kinds. Yep. So it's very important to have those. So you have conception, you have development. And as we start to grow, right, this is the first seed and like seeding new grass in a meadow. If you want to grow a rainforest, you have to seed and grow it. We need to not burn it down with antibiotics in early childhood. We are born, Amy, as 99% human cells. Only 1% of those are microbes within your body. By the time you die, you are 90% microbes and only 10% human cells. And so this is a development of fetus to adulthood and death is this growth of microbes in the body. They are everything. Some could argue more important than your DNA. So we're getting outside. We're playing with animals like the Nigerian farmers. You're living off the land as best you can. You're not breathing recycled air. You're avoiding medications, sugars, sweeteners, coloring, all these things that great, great grandma would not recognize as food or edible or as products or chemicals. These are the things that are causing problems today. There's a reason that autism used to be one in 50,000 or so by 2040 or something, it's expected to be one in two, one in three. It's like one in 300 or 3,000 now. Like it's crazy. Yeah. And we just go, well, we're better at detecting it. Nope. 
we're not, we're getting more toxic. Yeah. And so our development is trash, eating good foods, experiencing things, traveling in new countries. These are all inoculations, having pets. We know from microbiome testing, farmers tend to have the best guts. Those with pets have the second, those who live in themselves by themselves in a high rise apartment have the worst. Mm. So we have to get exposed, have to get inoculated. And that's how these guts develop. And if that's, if we want to keep a healthy gut development and maintenance at any time during those stages is going to be priority. Okay. So bottom line, we shouldn't all just take a probiotic and think it's all good, right? No. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Because, so you know, I, you got Jamie Lee Curtis with her Activia. I rip on her all the time because yes. I can't tell you the amount of patients that are like, well, I take Activia. Mm. Like, oh, good. Thanks. Great. Good well, job. Here, here's the thing about it. Microbiomes, We it was only recognized as being a thing back in the 90s. Shit, we didn't even know bacteria existed until Ignaz Semmelweis discovered it, a Hungarian physician back in 1856. That was when they first started saying, hey, you should probably wash your hands. And so this is all new. In the fifth or in the 90s, they just started recognizing that gut bacteria might be a thing we shouldn't kill at all. The study of the gut microbiome wasn't until the early 2000s, 2005 or so. And so we're only 20, 30 years into actually understanding its existence and its role. Now we know we have upwards of a hundred trillion bacteria living inside of our gut. It weighs two to three, or, or sorry, it's two to three percent of the average human's body weight, which is four to six pounds of your entire body is just bacteria. Inside that, we have viruses that outnumber your bacteria 35 to one, living in harmony with fungi and parasites and all kinds. And so we literally have, we have thousands of different species, possibly tens of thousands of different strains. Multiply those out, you got. 20 million different bacteria. And you go, I'm taking a probiotic. It's got five in it. I'm like, great. That's a grain of sand on a beach. Yeah. On the other hand, we have great bacteria that we know, like actionable stuff. We can test 50 to 100 of those 20 million on a GI map. That's how little we actually know. Now they're very actionable. And so we can make big differences to your general health, your immune system, everything. But to just pop a probiotic randomly, remember we talked about gut bacteria being harmony. We don't know how much gut bacteria we do or don't have in levels unless we test it. And so if you have too much of a good one, it can be as problematic as too much of a bad. And so for all you know, taking a probiotic, you might be pouring gasoline on the fire. And so we have to be very careful. I've seen Crohn's and colitis clients come in all the time. Like I'm taking all these ferments and all these probiotics. I'm getting worse. I'm like, yeah, you have a SIBO condition. You already have a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and you're pouring gasoline on the fire. Right. So we got to, we got to fix this. Like it's, it's very, very different from person to person, but I, I'm not an advocate necessarily for probiotics or against try them, but if you're not getting benefits, just stop. It's expensive pee. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And just like you said, I, I always say that too, you're feeding this group and then all of these little guys are being starved out because you're not feeding all of them. So you're only feeding a very small group of bacteria when you take a probiotic. So Yes. I'm glad you touched on that too. Thank you. It'll answer your question about how do we, because you asked how to fix it, I believe. And if you had, right. it's a great segue to go into. <laughs> so we don't end on that doom and gloom. Here's the first thing. And again, this goes for the full spectrum. When I'm working in Crohn's colitis, it's the worst of the worst gut disease. That foot, that heel in the shoe has worn out so much, half of them are down to the bone. Mm -hmm. Most listeners right now might be on the low end where their heel's a little bit irritated. The severity of how that happens, how that heel in the shoe wears down. Are you wearing socks? Is your shoe wet? Is there rocks or sand? How big or small is your shoe? These are your genetic factors, your lifestyle factors. They all matter. Mm -hmm. So we know inflammation is good. It's there to heal you. Like if you went to the doctor with a thorn in your hand, it was swollen and infected and pussy and bleeding, and they gave you ointment for the pain, you'd look at them like they got three heads. You'd be furious, like pull the thorn out. Right. We go in with a chronic inflammatory condition. They give us a drug, which is numbing cream for the pain. And we go, thank you, sir. Can I have another? And so we're not trained to look for the thorn. So number one, we have to find the root, the thing that stimulated and causes inflammation. This is my five R's. We have to remove the problem. The second thing we have to do is replenish the nutrients that were burned or lost because one of the leading causes of gut disease is nutrient deficiencies. It's toxins and it's microbial imbalances. So we have to remove the problem, replenish the nutrients that are lost, rebuild the microbiome, repair the tissues and rejuvenate the immune system, not boost it, rejuvenate it because it's all about balance and harmony. And most autoimmune conditions are an imbalance of an immune system where there's dominance to one side. And so we have to rejuvenate and bring it back. So remove, replenish, rebuild, repair, rejuvenate are my five R's. And that goes for anyone. 
And this is why like, we're reversing Crohn's colitis at 93%. So if you take the, most doctors think it's impossible. I've even got GIs going, oh, your medications must have finally started working after 15 years. And so the idea is you have to take this into your own hands at any stage of the spectrum. If you are someone who is bloated and dealing with IBS right now, remove the bad foods, remove the basic toxins, get outside a little bit more. Try taking a freaking multivitamin and a mineral supplement. You might That might be all you need, yeah. right? And then get outside, have pets, see friends. That might be all you need to repair the biome. You might need intensive work if you have a severe disease and your tissues can often repair themselves and the immune system can often rejuvenate itself. The more severe your heel is worn out, the more down to the bone you are, the more severe the gut disease, the more micromanagement you'll need in each stage of these conditions. But- Remove, replenish, rebuild, repair, rejuvenate is the five steps to healing damn near any gut. Well, and you have programs, you work with people, you actually have a a free gut health program on your site that we'll put the link in the show notes for, but tell people more about that and then tell people how they can find you and work with you and your podcast that I was on and all that good stuff. Yeah, we're actually releasing your episode here in a couple of weeks. Nice. Um, so yeah, looking forward to that. And so on the website, you can find everything you need at gutsolution.ca. That's all singular, gutsolution.ca. We have many gut health programs. We have them for IBS, constipation, diarrhea base, that's your IBS, C and D. We have them for acid reflux, fatty liver, basic, basic for even Crohn's colitis. They're not the ticket because oftentimes the more severe, you're going to need some help, but mm-hmm. it's, it's a good place to start. And that's what's really important. Um, you can find information there about the podcast. Uh, I have one called Reversible, the Ultimate Gut Health Podcast. That's reverse able. Get it? It's a pun. And yeah. so uh, you, it's it's amazing. We talk to famous, famous physicians. We've had you on there talking about the thyroid connection. And we talk about how your gut is connected to everything and how everything impacts your gut. And we give tips once a week. We have an interview or we and once a week, we also have a, uh, a short 10, 15 minute on like, here's a tip from a question. We answer questions from our listeners. So ask us a question right into the show. And you can find all that at gutsolution.ca. Oh, I love that. I love that. I'm interactive like that too. I love answering people's questions. So I'm so happy to see that you do that. It's so much fun. So I I don't like talking at my listeners. I want to, I want to teach them things that they want to know. Yes. Yes. On the same way. So, well, this has been fantastic. This is going to be a, a very much loved podcast, a very much needed podcast for my audience. So Josh, thank you so, so much for your time today. I mean, you've dropped some incredible bombs. So I appreciate you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, Amy.